Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Digital Humanities Center, the Virtual Digital Humanities Center. My name is Pam Lack. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Digital Humanities Librarian here at San Diego State University, uh, where I direct our Digital Humanities Center in the library, and I co-direct our Digital Humanities Initiative. And it's my great honor to uh, welcome you to today's talk. Um, I'm going to actually turn over introductions to Dr. David Camper. Um, and I'll just say that I'll put a, I'm about to put a link in chat with more information about the Digital Humanities Initiative and our upcoming and past recorded events. Uh, so thanks again and uh, take it away. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Pam. And uh, again, thank you so much for everyone showing up today. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Uh, Camper. Uh, I am a uh, Settler Scholar in the American Indian Studies Department and the Chair of the American Indian Studies Department. And um, we're really uh, grateful to the Center for Digital Humanities to um, partner with us today um, on this talk. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna introduce um, uh, our speaker um, and the talk in one second, but first I'd like to read our uh, San Diego State Kumeyaay land acknowledgement um, as, uh, as appropriate protocol for all events we do. Um, we stand upon a land that carries in the footsteps, excuse me, stand upon a land that carries the footsteps of millennia of Kumeyaay people. They are people whose traditional life ways intertwine with a worldview of earth and sky in a community of living beings. This land is part of a relationship that has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced the Kumeyaay people to the present day. It is a part of a worldview founded in the harmony of the cycles of the sky and balance in the forces of life. For the Kumeyaay, Red and black represent the balance of those forces that provide for harmony with our bodies as well as our world around us. As students, faculty, staff, and alumni of San Diego State University, we acknowledge this legacy um, from the Kumeyaay. We, we promote this balance in life. As we pursue our goals of knowledge and understanding, we find inspiration in the Kumeyaay spirit to open our minds and hearts. This is the legacy of the red and black. It is the land of the Kumeyaay. Uh, yay, uh, my heart is good. Um, and I, I just want to say, as uh, a dear friend and former colleague, um, Kacha uh, Balding Risley um, has reminded many people um, when you do a land acknowledgement, it should not just be acknowledging the land, but a sort of call to action. And so I suppose my call to action today would to encourage all you folks who are familiar with digital humanities and joining us today to learn more about. Um, the Kumeyaay space and the land that we're in and um, indigenous people in general. And so being um, a part of the Zoom call today, I promise you, you will learn a ton um, about indigenous people from our fantastic scholar, um, Lorena Fontaine, Dr. Lorena Fontaine. Um, she is the first um, of our Fulbright scholars um, in a brand new partnership that the American Indian Studies Department at San Diego State has with Fulbright Canada. And we're so thrilled to be able to have this, to bring down First Nation scholars for, so, for a semester at a time. And uh, we are so fortunate that our first, our, our initial one is um, Dr. Fontaine, who's, as you will see today, work is just fantastic. Um, she is Korean Anishinaabe from the Sag King First Nations. Um, she's an Associate Professor of Indigenous Studies at the University of Winnipeg. Um, and has a PhD from University of Manitoba and a master's in law um, from the University of Arizona. And she has a pretty incredible list of publications and research projects. And I'm just gonna kind of hit on what I'm most excited about and what we'll hear today, which is her a uh, couple of things. It's her work with her own community and several communities in the region around her university on language renewal and, and thinking about the process also of, how indigenous people can work together, or indigenous academics can work with indigenous elders to really improve the process of teaching language and, and, and renewal of language. Um, and then equally important is the work she has done with survivors and descendants of survivors from the residential school system um, in Canada. And um, I'm sure you will hear more about that today, but the, for those of you who don't know, the residential school is the sort of analog to the boarding school system in the United States um, as the forced assimilation um, process of settler colonialism up there. Um, for this work, she's used both her legal experience and helped draft um, national policies uh, in Canada for reconciliation and restitution for residential school survivors. 
Um, and uh, also, um, she, her, she's used her work to create a digital-based oral story project um, to collect stories of trauma and healing from residential school survivors and, and their descendants. Um, and so um, this, this particular work, she's been able to engage in kind of comparative genocide studies as well, um, particularly with the National Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, and the Shoah Foundation uh, in Los Angeles. Um, so her work is just really exciting and we're, we're so thrilled to have her um, uh, for this, the, here this semester. And, and I'm honored to say I'm thrilled because I feel like now I have a new friend, um, you know, up in Canada. And, um, and, oh, and I'm, I'm also to add that when uh, Lorena wanted to let you all know that she is now in love with the Pacific Ocean, like I think many of us here are too. So we're glad to be able to share the Pacific Ocean um, with her and I will, uh, stop talking now and, and hand it over to uh, Dr. Fontaine. Um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for the warm reception that I've received um, since I've arrived uh, to San Diego. Buju, my gun gijik and dishnikaz, my gun and dudem, saging and donjiba, gawi napiji ninta, ojibwe mozi. So I've just introduced myself in my uh, ancestral language, which is uh, Anishinaabe or Ojibwe in English. Um, I, I introduced my spirit name, which is Wolf Sky Woman, and I'm also a member of the Wolf Clan. Um, and I acknowledge that I'm learning to speak my language. Um, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am to be on this beautiful territory. I, as David mentioned, I've fallen in love with the ocean. Um, I'm from a territory that is very much dominated by flatlands. We've got a joke that you can see your dog run away for three days on our territory because it's so flat. <laughs> um, but I, um, I love, I, I have fallen in love with the, the territory here, so I can see myself coming back for many years to come. Um, I'd like to just uh, thank the American Indian Studies Program and also the Digital Humanities for, for organizing this event. I know it takes a lot of effort and a lot of people. Um, and I'd also like to just say a special thanks to Harmit Shima and Kate Reagan, um, who helped put this talk together. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about how I got involved um, in this type of research. Um, as David mentioned, I um, I'm a scholar, but I'm also a lawyer. I worked on residential school claims in Canada from, well, I only actually lasted for a year because I found it very traumatizing. Um, I was uncovering my own history as I was working on the residential school claims. When I started, there were 10,000 individual claims against the Canadian government and the churches for the abuses that Aboriginal people experienced in the schools. Um, my parents, uh, both my mother and father, as well as my maternal um, and paternal grandparents attended these schools. Um, the last one closed in 1996 in Winnipeg. So we have our history to connection to these schools is quite a bit closer than, than here. Um, so I'm gonna just show, I'll just start showing my video, my, uh, Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yeah, okay, perfect. I hate it when I run into snags. I'm just gonna. Um, so I was uncovering my own history during this, um, during this period when I was working on a class action suit. Um, I started to make connections to my own family of the impact of the schools. Um, up until that point, I hadn't given it a, a great deal of thought. Um, and I started looking for research material on the intergenerational effects of the schools. And this was in about 2010. Um, well, between the, the period of 2003 to 2010, and there is very little material um, on uh, on the legacy of the residential schools. And I actually found um, a lot of material um, written by 
descendants of Holocaust survivors that I made a lot of uh, started making a lot of connections and that sort of veered my research in a different direction. But um, that's that's another topic for discussion. Um, I was asked in 2010 actually to engage in a, a research project. So I wasn't the researcher, I was being researched. Um, the woman who um, started the research wanted to look at the intergenerational effects of residential schools on Indigenous women whose mothers attended the schools. And so it was at that time that I started learning about uh, digital storytelling. Um, just going to keep that there. So the focus of this project was to look at um, the legacy of the schools on daughters. So all our mothers attended the schools. And the researcher wanted to not just distract information from us. She wanted to give us a scale back. She wanted to give us a gift back for doing the research. So she taught us how to do digital stories. Um, we used um, the digital storytelling method to, um, to share our own experiences. And um, it's a, a method that I've been using ever since. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, a project that I used, uh, the digital storytelling method. Um, this project led to four um, additional years of research. So from 2010 to 2014, um, all the women in, in this picture here became researchers. We became the digital storytellers and we became researchers. Um, we have since created about 40 digital stories um, on the legacy of the schools and now on heart health, which I'm going to talk, which will be the focus of today's talk. Um, I just want to add that um, probably the most impactful experience that I've had in using digital stories um, was when I worked with a, a group of young Indigenous women that were in a youth centre. And they came in and we wanted to share um, our experiences as descendants of uh, residential school survivors and they did not want to talk to us. They just came in and they just sat there. Um, when we showed them the videos, um, they became very intrigued. They saw that we were vulnerable in our in sharing these experiences and after we showed the videos, we could not get them to stop talking. So it opened up um, opportunities to for engagement and um, trust building with with these women. So the story, uh, the digital storytelling um, project that I'm going to talk today about is on heart health, the heart health of Indigenous peoples and the focus is on um, Indigenous peoples um, in Canada from the province that I'm from, which is Manitoba. It's north of it's located north of North Dakota. Um, so from Grand Forks, it's probably about a two hour drive north. Um, the project was a community based digital storytelling project that used oral history and arts based research um, to explore uh, culturally rooted knowledge of heart health amongst Indigenous women. And so um, this method of using digital story is a decolonizing approach um, to um, to do research with Indigenous peoples. Um, the storytellers, um, the ones that created the videos, um, tell their own stories, they use their own words, their own photos and music and uh, videos. Um, they are the uh, the creators of of their of their own history, their own not and the way that they want to share their own knowledge is based on um, their own creation. So this is a story of the team for this project. Um, in the back um, are all the people that helped with uh, with the researcher, um, you know, the videographers, um, uh, the other coordinator for the project and in the front are all the women that um, created the stories which I'm going to talk about um, in more detail in a minute. 
So the object of the research was to honor the traditions of oral history and storytelling as a means to elevate Indigenous knowledge and wellness practices amongst Indigenous women and their heart health, and to locate Indigenous women's concepts, language, and experiences of heart health. Um, another objective was to initiate dialogue with Euro Western medical students to extend understandings of heart health amongst Indigenous people. So we actually showed um, these videos and um, also some of the, the oral history that we were able to obtain from this, um, from this research. We showed them to over 200 medical students. They were first year medical, their first year students that were in medical school wanting to be doctors or to become nursing uh, nurses. They viewed all the digital stories and we did some peer review or peer teaching to find out what they, um, they gained from watching the videos. And I can tell you um, about 95% of the students that we heard from were going to use um, what they heard from the, the videos, what they learned from the peer, peer sharing um, uh, teaching methodology that we used, um, it was going to impact the way that they um, treated patients in the future. I'm not going to talk so much about that portion of the, um, of the research. I'm going to focus more on the methodology today. So um, the reason why we engaged in this research um, was primarily because um, research done in the medical field has been done primarily um, on Indigenous peoples um, without um, often consent, but also um, uh, um, without our knowledge um, in the research that they gauged, engaged in. So we wanted to hear from Indigenous women um, in our communities um, we wanted them to talk about the knowledge that they had about heart health based on being um, heart health patients or for, um, or for their knowledge and caring for people that have had heart health. So we wanted to talk to them as mothers and our aunties um, to share the knowledge that they had about um, heart health. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about the stats because they're, it's quite um, startling when we look, about, look at um, heart health disparities globally um, and the service inequities um, specific to heart health that are reported among Indigenous populations um, worldwide. In Canada, the general population rates are declining. Um, the rates of coronary heart disease have increased among Indigenous populations. And um, I guess the one of the most startling um, stats that we found is that while Indigenous peoples are two times more likely to report heart, heart diseases, um, coronary heart disease amongst Indigenous women is responsible for up to 53% higher death rates in comparison to non-Indigenous women. Um, so the, you know, the heart um, health of Indigenous women are very much impacted by heart disease. So it was very important for us to hear um, about their experiences. So we started this research actually with um, uh, Ininawak, Cree, and Anishinaabe or Ojibwe health practices. Um, so historically heart health was approached from holistically by Indigenous peoples. It was integrated into a, a way of life that included caring for the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of indiv individuals, community, and family. Um, and I started this, um, this research with a teaching um, from my community, from my auntie. Um, I sat in the back of the car with her one day as we were traveling up north and we talked about heart health and um, the teaching that she provided me with is it started from our language, our Cree language. She said that this is in, um, using our Indigenous languages is critical for exploring heart health 
because it provides a culturally specific lens. In the Swampy Cree dialect that um, my, um, on my mother's side we speak, Mite Achimawan um, is loosely translated um, in English as heart talk. But conceptually, Mite Achimawan encompasses complex cultural teachings integral to caring for the mind, the physical body, the spirit, as well as to living healthy lives. Foundational to um, heart health teaching is that um, we are all gifted, every human being at birth by the creator um, with a heart. And it's where our emotions and our intelligence is derived. To care for our, our heart health, um, there must be included an understanding of how to care for the uh, psychological, physical, emotional, and spiritual well being. So in, um, I can go on about the teachings, but that would, you know, I could probably go on for hours, but I'll just share that much right now. Um, what I want to do next is just talk about the storytellers, the women um, that shared their stories. We had six women to agree to participate in a five-day digital storytelling workshop that was held um, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I teach. Um, each of them had a medically diagnosed heart condition or had been a caregiver for someone with a heart condition. All the women were 65 years of age and older, and they spoke English as a second language. Their first language um, was Cree, or is Cree, and all the women came from northern communities. Um, five of the women gave permission to publicly share their digital stories and details about themselves. The sixth woman did not give permission. She actually just wanted to have an opportunity to share her horrific experience actually in the, uh, in the um, healthcare field and she wanted to share it with other Indigenous women. She wanted to create a video and share it with her community. So she didn't want to share her video publicly, but um, I can tell you that it was very healing for her to engage in the project. Um, so the first uh, two women um, are actually related. Christina Baker, um, she's from a community called Split Lake. And um, her, her aunt is Mabel Horton, um, who's a member of Nelson House. Um, their collaborative story featured images from family camps um, in northern Manitoba. And they described the importance of traditional foods, physical activity as a way of being healthy. Christina and Mabel narrated their story in the Cree language to express the importance of eating well and keeping active. Um, this is Eliza Beardy. She's Ojibwe Cree from the Wasagamek First Nation in Northern Manitoba. Um, her story features images of her parents, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren as she describes the importance of family relationships and bonds to heart health. As a residential school survivor, she speaks about the lasting heartbreak experienced by her parents and their children caused by separation. Uh, Virginia um, is Soto and she comes from Barron's River First Nation. She shared two short stories in her videos and the first describes the enduring love and pride of her grandchildren and the importance of family relationships and values. Her second story features the landscape of her community and a story of racial discrimination experienced by a family member as he sought medical care for a serious heart health issue. Um, this last uh, um, woman is Esther Sanderson, who's my aunt and who gave me the Cree teaching um, to start this project. She describes her personal journey of the spirit and the mind during her heart transplant surgery and recovery. She also shares the importance of family, spirituality, and culture in, in her video. I'm going to actually show um, two of the videos at the, um, at the end of this talk so you get a sense of um, how beautiful these stories are. Um, so the methods of this um, project 
um, is based in, in Inuak, Cree, and Anishinaabe Ojibwe protocols. Um, we used, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we used um, a berry, cer uh, berry ceremony at the beginning of this um, project. So strawberries or heart berries, as we call them, were used because they, rec they are recognized as medicines um, for Cree and Ojibwe peoples in my community. We also did a water ceremony. A water ceremony is conducted because it's recognized as a source of life. Um, women are the carriers and protectors of the water in my community. We also had a feast um, where we you know, had delicious food. Um, we used our traditional foods and medicines um, during the feast. Um, it provided um, an opportunity for the women to meet at the beginning to develop uh, trust and knowledge of each other. We did a feast at the beginning of the digital storytelling project, but we also did a feast at the end to celebrate um, the uh, the creation, um, the beautiful stories that the women created. Um, so we started um, after we did the, um, the, the Indigenous protocols on the first day. The second day we had learning circles. So on that first uh, morning after we did the ceremonies, uh, the women had breakfast and uh, we had a learning circle. Um, we created a safe space for the women to share their ideas and an opportunity re to reflect on their stories. The uh, learning circle also allowed the women to look deeply into their understanding of the heart, heart health, causes of heart disease, and their personal heart health experiences. And this, this is, I think, one of the most valuable parts of doing the kind of methodology that we've developed. Because the women share, they engage with each other's stories, and it's an opportunity for them to be heard and to hear each other's um, stories. After this process, the women were bonded, and I can tell you that they um, they became lifelong friends because of the their opportunity to share um, their, their experiences, but also to hear what other women have experienced. So over the next um, three and a half days, the women um, were assisted to develop a script. So it's a one page script um, that they wrote, uh, a narration of an experience they wanted to share. And um, it's a first person narrative on um, their experiences with heart health. After the women created the one page script, um, they narrated the script um, with the help of technicians um, to, uh, you know, to, um, to have their story recorded. Um, they did, they, af after that, they, um, they compiled their, their pictures, their videos, their photos, um, along with their script. And that, that's what their, their video, um, that's how they constructed their, their video. On um, the last day, we had a celebration um, where all the women shared their digital stories with family members um, and anybody else that they wanted to um, invite. And um, the we were we obtained consent for the from the women to share the videos um, at that time. Um, as I mentioned, five of the women uh, agreed to share their videos publicly. Um, we also were received consent for us to do an analysis of the learning circle as well as what's contained in the in the videos. So we learned a lot of things from these videos. I'm not going to go into detail um, too much. Um, the report is actually on some links that we're going to share with you after. You can go and look more in depthly into what the women shared um, during those learning circles. Um, the, some of the, the themes that came out of their learning circle was that um, changes to diet, lifestyle, life, uh, lifestyles, um, 
other health related conditions, experiences with the healthcare system, the legacy of the residential schools, as well as relationships with their grandchildren and grandchildren became themes of the study. Um, and I'm just going to just share um, the one on residential schools um, because one of the, I think the main areas or one of the main um, themes that had a significant impact on me personally was when they talked about broken hearts. Um, the stories talked about the fact that when they were in the residential schools that they, they developed a broken heart because they were separated from their families and their communities. Um, they, one of the women said, I think one of the things that I see that really changed our lives was the residential school. Our whole story, our whole world turned upside down. Residential schools produced fractured relationships between children and parents or children and their grandparents. This had an impact on both the children's and adults' health and well-being. And this is an example of um, how, treat, how uh, the children were, were treated in the schools. They lost the ability to speak and understand the only language their grandparents spoke. So there was a gap again, and it was hurtful in the heart, to their heart, in their heart, to their grandparents because they couldn't speak to their grandchildren. That caused stress for their grandparents as well. Um, experiences at the residential schools have had links to physical heart health as well as the emotional and spiritual um, impacts. Um, and I, I guess the personal connection that I have um, to this is my father um, passed away of a, of a heart attack when I was quite young. He was very traumatized by the schools um, and had repeated nightmares. I don't know what happened to him in the schools because um, he passed away before um, people started talking about the schools um, in our community. I can also say that um, we are still dealing with um, the silent shame in our communities and we are still trying very uh, much to to share this history with Canadians, but as well as with young people that still haven't made the connection of the legacy of these schools on on their health and well being today. So um, we're going to just I'm going to share you um, two of the videos. They are very short, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Pam has has agreed to show the videos. Thank you, Pam. October 2004, I suffered a major heart attack that forced me to change my life. For 12 days, I lay in a coma in a hospital ICU, supported by a heart and lung machine and the cardiology team, while my family kept watch in a hospital waiting room. In those 12 days, I traveled in time. Sometimes I went to a place called Nothing. Other times I went to the big old house where I lived as a happy child prior to residential school. I relived some of the horrors of residential school I saw my children and grandchildren who warmed my spirit. I visited the teaching lodge where I learned about Minopimatisiwin teachings. In this travel time, I also had two profound dreams. first dream, I stand at the doorway of the universe. As I stood waiting, a needle flew by, who looked straight at me. As it flew by, a big voice sounded that said, you can't stay here. The second dream, and I walk in a luminous fog area, I see something in the distance. As I walk towards it, I see it's a white hospital bed. 
At the foot of the bed leaves something, a silver heart beating softly. I asked, what's that? The big voice I heard earlier replied, that's a gift for you. Then I woke up laying in my hospital bed. I saw my son sitting beside me. I asked, what happened? Where am I? He said, you're in the hospital, you had a heart attack. And then I went away again. I remained in the hospital for three months, receiving various medical heart treatments and two months as an outpatient for follow-up. When I returned to my home community of Opasquihag in northern Manitoba, I began doing the hard emotional work of rebuilding my life and to try to understand what the gift of this new heart meant for me. I asked the questions, who am I? Am I somebody different because of this new heart? Then one day I remembered the silver heart dream, which caused me to reflect on the real meaning of my heart. It was a gift of life. I also came to understand my heart had two functions. First, it is a physical organ that pumps blood through my body. And second, is the blood flowing into my heart that carries my ancestral Cree language, ceremonies, songs, values, and life teachings. It is the same blood that has flowed through my ancestors that flows through me, which makes me who I am. Horton Wani <laughs> Mistake yet 
You can keep mata hijik. You can keep it in your hands. 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 Tapi ibu bapa pergi ke kanal pada kau kacau kasih pada ik, aku mina kacau masih naik di pada ik. Kan tapi ibu tera ibu mesti ibu kau kacau kapu mesti ayam mesti kau mak ibu katu sekarang pun ibu tera ibu tahu agak sekarang text messages kau sekarang tiga usah. Maka ibu mina meski ibu ni juga kau meski ibu sekolah bukan situ dah kau tanya ibu sekarang kau kasih mesti aku mak mesti uji sekolah usah. Aku minat lagi wujud sih wujud sih. Hmm, pegas lagi wujud macam dance kai saya ada tu inu tiga aku set. Apa dance lagi sih kan nui di mesut. Ika tu mikus kati. Tak, aku tak aku. Nanti lagi aku nai sih melu deh tak. Nih aku tak aku. Aku minat hiu mesti hiu macap macut tiga tiga nau. Kena nak itu ana nau macam kami haya kapu kama mau ya. Mitti, pagi masih kewan, ya aku tak sukses mitti ibu pada ke kewena, aku mina hiu, kita kasih ayah ya aku, kita mis misiaski, aku saya sen, kau sen tu tak aku, aku masih kisku aku, aku masih kini aku, kau kisku nama masuk cek, ada sah hiu, mitti kewena astiu, mak aku sudah patut kita kita tuan anak kita nama mitti, si, ni fikir, ya, kau tak pun, kau ni, aku. So that's that's the project I worked on. Um, I'm I'm really grateful that I've been able to share it in in this part of the world, and I hope you enjoyed the videos. And I'll open it up for questions now or comments. I can also just keep talking about the project too, because there's so much to uh, to share. Okay, John. Got your hand raised. Hi, um, public history student here at um, SSU, um, Nakota from Fort Peck. My question is, I, I love everything you do. Um, There's a lot of stuff that I would want to do. Um, however, one, one question I have, so one of the problems I feel like taking in, uh, you know, public history or history courses is that there's a lot of criticism from oral historians that, you know, this work, I, I would say, isn't I guess academic almost did you ever have any of that criticism and how did you kind of fight through that yeah um well I mean there's two ways to answer that question I guess the first is um in Canada uh because I'm also a lawyer um we uh uh the courts have have now um in Canada recognized oral evidence um, as valid testimony. Um, so that is, you know, um, I think a positive direction for looking at or our oral history as a, val a valid way of doing research. Um, but I'll just give you another, um, you know, way to respond to that. When we showed these videos to 200 medical students, um, all of them uh, got something very valuable out of the research. And all of them said, well, I would say, I, I think I said 95% of them. So like 195 of the students that viewed these videos said it, it was going to have an impact on the way they treated not only Indigenous people, but other patients, that they needed to spend more time with their patients in order to develop trust in a relationship. So. Um, up in Canada, we're using digital storytelling methods as a way to um, decolonize the way that we do research. 
it's used in the courts and it's also used as a curriculum now in um, in various faculties such as medicine. So we've got a question from Larry and then a question after that in chat. Okay. Hello, uh, thank you for your time. Um, what I heard from, from your lecture today put a lot of emphasis on basically nutrition as regards to what they used to eat historically compared to kind of what they were moved into and, and started eating now. How much of, of that uh, impacted their health? Actually, um, food, food is definitely part of um, one of the, the impacts on heart health. But um, if you look at the material, um, the we've got some research papers. Um, we've got uh, some reports that we did with a, um, a research, a national research center in Canada. Um, the women recognized um, that the heart is, you know, is an organ, but there's also some physical, spiritual, and emotional aspects that affect our heart health. And so food is important. Um, the fact that our diets have been changed, diet has been radically changed, um, is a contributor to poor heart health. But the women actually focused more on the impact of being torn away from their parents, their community, when they were kids, when they went to the school. And I can tell you, because I did a lot of work with residential school survivors, that all of them talked about having a broken heart. And we've, we've seen high rates of heart health, uh, poor heart health conditions and um, people dying of heart attacks. Um, a lot of them attribute to that poor heart health um, to their residential school experiences. Thank you. Okay. So a question in chat um, sort of builds off of your response. Um, whether um, you can speak a little further about why the disproportionate impact um, on Indigenous women in terms of heart problems. Yeah, you know what, that's a really good question. And that's one of the stats that just really stuck out um, to me. And um, after we finished um, this video um, digital storytelling project, we have a national organization called the Heart and Stroke Foundation that um, took a, 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 a keen interest in, in the stories, but the project. And um, they're still doing research um, to, to find out um, why Indigenous women are having um, heart attacks. And I, like, I can just share from my own family experience. My aunt was the one who did the video where she had the heart transplant. She said that a lot of women, Indigenous women, are misdiagnosed, that they come in the hospital and they have heart attacks differently. And I think all women in general. So um, I, think, I think part of the, the problem is that they're being misdiagnosed when they come in, um, which leads to, you know, like further uh, um, impact on their heart health. Why they're having higher rates of heart attacks to begin with is something I think we're still looking into. Thank you. And another question in chat. Uh, Margaret writes, this work seems to be related to research on the impact of adverse childhood events, ACEs. Have, have you tied it to that research at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, if I, you know, I've just emphasized the fact that a lot of the women talked about um, being disconnected from their parents um, as young kids, the fact that they, um, like my mother um, lived off of um, porridge um, from the age of three till she was 16, like porridge in the morning, but then they got very little nutritious foods during the day. Um, and uh, so it's, it's the food, it's the way that they were um, treated in the schools. A lot of them were physically and sexually abused in the schools. Not all of them, but a lot of them were. A lot of them were punished for speaking the only language that they knew. Um, 
And, you know, like they say that our foundation of our life is set, you know, for our health and just who we are as people um, up until the age of eight. So I would say that, um, yes, we've drawn conclusions that the way that these women were treated in the schools contributed um, to their poor heart health, but also their their families poor heart health and it's interesting because i'm not a heart i'm not a health researcher i'm not a heart health researcher um, we did these videos because um, uh, women in the community asked us to do this so i learned a lot um, as a scholar about heart health because of this experience So we've got several questions in chat and several folks with their hands up. I'm going to try to alternate so that we um, have a chance for everybody. Um, Isabel um, asks about uh, truth and reconciliation. Uh, she writes, after these findings that the trauma of being in residential schools and the lasting effects on culture, language, and family connection had such a profound of, uh, impact on health, how did you go about addressing this aspect? And she thought she heard you mention um, truth and reconciliation and, and whether you could talk more about that. Okay, so when, um, when uh, the class action suit was, um, was filed against Canada, so we amalgamated the 10,000 individual claims against the federal government in the, and the churches into one class action suit. Um, the, the federal government and the churches settled because they knew that they would never be able to deal with all the claims in this lifetime. And um, it would cost them billions and billions of dollars. So um, as part of the settlement agreement, um, they, the survivors that advanced their claims said that they wanted a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to document this history so that Canadians, um, Indigenous peoples, uh, people around the world would know this history um, so that it would never happen again. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission had a five-year mandate. Um, they collected over 6,000 testimonies from residential school survivors and their families, and they, um, they produced a six-volume report that is all online. If you ever want to look into the history of the schools, I encourage you to look through any of these reports. Um, they're all accessible online. So part of the digital storytelling work that I do, and my, I think my, my career um, on the legacy of the school um, is attributed to the bravery of these survivors for advancing these claims. And it is part of, um, the work of reconciliation that this commission started. It really speaks to the power of storytelling, um, even when uh, somebody doesn't want to share their story beyond very particular people, and that it's important that we honor um, those, those choices. Um, yeah. Just because it's digital and can be shared easily doesn't mean it should be. Um, and that's really powerful. Um, uh, Helen, or I'm sorry, Helen, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and I apologize. Yeah, it's Helen. Thank you. Uh, go ahead with your question, please. Uh, Dr. Fontaine, I really enjoyed your presentation. I know that you mentioned um, dark shame, and then you also mentioned that your late father had nightmares. Is the general topic of residential schools like a don't ask, don't tell amongst the community? Is it like a highly like a taboo subject or is it something that um, that's openly talked about? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission opened up. I, well, I would say it started back when um, residential school survivors started filing claims. It gave people the courage to tell their story. Um, I didn't know about this history until my 20s, um, even though my parents and grandparents attended, because as families, we don't talk about this history. I think it's too painful and it's too close. Um, the first time that anybody had ever asked me about being raised by parents that attended these schools was in the 2010 research project that I was involved in. Up until then, I never talked about it. I never asked questions. Um, I found out about the abuse that my mom experienced at a conference where she was giving a keynote. 
Um, I don't talk to her about um, her experience in the schools. Um, I, I do research, I go to, you know, I look at the testimonies, I actively participated in the TRC events, I parked myself in the front row, at least on for one day to hear survivors so I could hear my mother's experience, my father's experience. And um, I can tell you that Canada is starting to implement more curriculum about the schools from K to 12. I teach about this history um, at the university I teach at. Um, but I can tell you that in our Indigenous communities, um, kids are still not learning this history. And that is a real crime. Um, we need to do a better job of integrating this history um, so that kids learn about it in kinder, well, you know, uh, yeah, from kindergarten to grade uh, to grade 12 and then into university. There's still silent shame about this history, but I also think it's a protective mechanism um, of survivors that don't want to do further harm to their families. So we're still on a journey about talking about these experiences, but we still have a long way to go. Should I go ahead, Pam? Please, David, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, well, you know, first I just wanna thank you so much for this really important work. You know, I know you're not doing it alone, but you're the one here <laughs> today with us. So thank you for that. And, and you know, uh, thank you to the women who you work with to share their powerful story, you know, be willing to share their powerful stories. It's really um, incredible. Um, and I was really struck by, um, I believe it's your aunt, the first video is your aunt, right? right. Um, um, the way she talks about her dreams and you mentioned your father and dreams. And of course, you know, we know that um, for indigenous folks, like dreams are a way to come to know it, right? Like that, that is one source of knowledge is, is through dreaming. And I'm curious, like how, you know, these med students who are trained and, and, um, very tangible, uh, you know, uh, ways to come to knowledge, how they took that, you know, how, you know, and the challenge of kind of like thinking about these alternative ways to come to knowing and, and how open to that with her and how do you kind of like incorporate, you know, um, that. Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, so, Yes, for Indigenous people, oftentimes we get our knowledge from our dreams. Um, we get our spirit names from often from Indigenous uh, um, healers, teachers um, from from dreams. Um, in terms of the the medical students, um, what we did with them is we did uh, peer teaching. So we showed them the videos. And we asked them what they got out of the videos. So they started sharing. And then, you know, that would allow for another student to, you know, you know, it's, it's sometimes a bit uh, when you're put on the spot to, um, to share what you get out of the videos because they are, it's not like reading a medical textbook, right? Where you can recite what you've just learned. Th these are videos that all uh, people will get different things out of. So the medical students didn't focus so much on the dreaming part. What they focused on was that the heart is not, it's an organ, but it's a very complex organ. And it's not just about um, the physical health, but it's also about the emotional, spiritual, and cultural health of people. It's about um, having healthy relationships with family and people. And I think that that is one of the things that they they got out of it. I I we I sat in one of the peer teaching groups. I didn't sit, sit in all of them, and in my group, I didn't hear anybody focus on the dreaming part. Um, they focused more on the relationship building part. But is definitely another aspect um, of the the research that I think people can draw different conclusions from. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, before we wrap up, which I will hand over to, to Pam to do, I wanted to um, announce to everyone, uh, 
purely out of coincidence, we're having a, a talk tomorrow night about the boarding school experience um, in the US. It's our Linda Parker uh, annual uh, memorial lecture. She was a, um, uh, a, a former faculty member who passed away. And we have a guest who uh, from the University of Irvine, UC Irvine, who's gonna be talking about adult experiences in the Carlisle Institute. So I'm gonna find that, put it in the chat right now, but I, I wanna uh, join you all uh, for further conversation tomorrow night. Um, if you like as well. And then, you know, once again, on behalf of everyone, I want to thank you so much um, for not only the work you did in your talk today, but, you know, coming down with us, coming down to be with us this semester. It's an honor to be here. And thank you okay. so much for joining me today. And I just want to echo David in thanking you for this um, wonderful talk, this opportunity to learn from you. Um, it's really helping me think about digital storytelling in very different ways um, that I than I currently teach it, um, but very much in community-based um, knowledge production. Um, and uh, it's just really, um, you've given me so much to think about as I'm sure you've given so many other folks here in the, in the virtual room uh, think, things to think about. Thank you all. Uh, please join me in showering your appreciation, whether it's through your emojis or if you wanna unmute yourself. Uh, thank you all. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop the recording, but uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Fontaine. This was just um, incredible. <laughs>